Welcome, everybody, to another life-changing experience with us here at Powerhouse Foursquare Church in beautiful San Pedro, California. I hope you are having a great morning, because if you are, it's just going to get better. Or should I say, it's going to get gooder and gooder. That's right, lousy grammar, but great theology. All right, so um, you want to hear something good? Yes. Are you ready? You ready to hear something good? All right. Something happened that is just great that happened. An answer to prayer. Ready for an answer to prayer? Yes. It happened just the other, just last week, uh, Mar uh, May 17th. It says this. Today, a California district court entered an order approving Liberty Council's settlement of the lawsuit on behalf of Harvest Rock Church and Harvest International Ministry they, they, they fought, uh, they represented the Church of California against California Governor Gavin Newsom. The full and final settlement, and let me tell you what this is. This is when Gavin Newsom shut down the churches and did not want the churches to, to meet uh, because of uh, uh, singing and chanting. I don't know what his reasons were. The minute he did that, the church rose up. Yes. And uh, Shayon, Pastor Shayon in Pasadena, led this and he uh, 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 did a, count, a lawsuit against the governor of Newsom and it was just now settled. Here it is, it says, the full and final settlement was approved today, the district court and thus is the first statewide permanent injunction in the country against COVID restrictions on churches and places of worship. This is the first statewide permanent injunction in the country against COVID restrictions on churches and places of worship. Under the agreed statewide permanent injunction, all California churches may hold worship without discriminatory re restrictions. Yeah, under the settlement, California may no longer impose discrim uh, uh, discriminatory restrictions upon houses of worship. The governor must also pay Liberty Council $1.35 million to reimburse attorney fees and costs. Wow. Welcome back. Not that we've ever left, but anyway, for those of you who welcome back, this is good. I got to get a drink on that one. It's an answer to prayer. And uh, so today, we are going to look at uh, the goodness of God. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Is it, um, and we're going to look at the goodness of God. Uh, is, is he really good? Is God really good? Yes, he is. You sound too confident. Did I, did, I, did, I, did I surprise you with that one? Is God good? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to be taking an honest look at questions like, is God good? And what about when he... Ah. So we're also going to be looking at a very popular misquote that, uh, from Scripture that we are all too familiar with that people use. But first... Did you know? Did you know that Burt Reynolds was originally cast as Han Solo in the Star Wars film and then dropped out right before the filming? I did not know that. Did you know that? Ooh. Did you know that your thumb is the same length as your nose? Look at everybody. Did you know that we change our voice when we talk? to people we like. Yes. You know that? Yes. Yes. Honey, do you think that's true? <laughs> yeah? Hmm. Right. Did you know that you can't usually smell your own house or your own perfume because of a survival instinct called Olfactory 
adaptation. That's easy for me to say. The brain, how do you say it? Alpha Tori adaptation. If I say it faster, it sounds like I know what I'm saying now. <laughs> Alpha Tori adaptation. Okay. The br what it means is the brain is always looking for a new, unusual, or changing smells as a sign of possible danger. So it ignores all the, spell the smells that have already become familiar. Did you know that? Do you know that there's a really bad odor in here? <laughs> no, huh? Look at that. We're all used to it. That's right. And all these did you knows are brought to you by they. Right, because that's what they say. Okay, uh, we're going to jump right into it. Is God good? Yes. Hmm. What about when God does things that brings pain and confusion? Okay, has, I mean, has that ever happened to you uh, yeah. where uh, there has been a, a really hard uh, pain um, in your life? And, and really the question, does God do things that bring pain and confusion no. or not? No. He doesn't at all? No. Hmm. Anybody, anybody think that God doesn't bring any, no pain, no anything like that? He allows it, he okay, it. but he doesn't cause it at all, huh? Hmm. Hmm. He doesn't seem to be the mind out of understanding. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. We're good. This is what we'll look into. Um, there's a song that uh, that I have uh, I've liked through the through the decades, and uh, if you've been around church for the last 15 years, you you've heard this song. If you know it, you could sing it with me. If you don't, you could listen to it. But it goes like this. You ready? Yeah. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose the same. Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Hmm. Is that true that the Lord gives and takes away? Yes. You're just saying it. <laughs> Is it true? Yeah. Yes? No? How many of you say yes? Raise your hand. How many of you just say no? Raise your hand. Ooh. All right. Let me do that one more time because some of you wanted to say no, but you just noticed there weren't people around. So if some of you say yes, raise your hand. Okay, some of you say no, raise your hand. Oh, added one, another one. Now, interesting. Let's take a look at this. You know, a, a friend of mine just lost his wife to cancer uh, in March. And he said these words to me as we were having lunch this week. He said, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And then he went on to say, you know, I'm not going to turn away from the Lord, but I'm kind of angry at him. Have you ever, have you ever come across that? Have you ever experienced that or heard that or, or maybe been with somebody or maybe experienced it yourself? Because I'm sure you've at least heard these words. Uh, spoken at a funeral. Yeah. Is there a common word that people, or whenever an unexplainable disaster happens, 
But is it true? Is it true that the Lord gives and takes away? Now, most of you said yes. yes. How do you know that? Just think, how do you know that? I mean, and let me tell you why I'm asking. Because you might be, you might, somebody might ask you this question and, or a question of some sort of the Bible. And they go, and they go, how do you know that? And you go, yeah. Art? We have an example in the Bible uh, of Job's life, how God blessed him with children. And okay. they would always take turns eating food at each other's houses. Okay. And Job was very happy. Um, sacrificing to God and honoring God all the time. Being oh. careful what he did. Okay, so Job, is there any other place? Yeah, uh, Terry? Uh, I would say King Nebuchadnezzar, um, how and he had his dreams and how he had a, a great empire, but because he did not acknowledge John, God, that he was allowed to be as, as an animal for seven years until he came to the acknowledgement that God was God. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar, and he was he was taken away from him. Yes. So was that the same as Job, though? Was Job uh, not following God that he uh, took the consequence of God taking him? Was that the same thing or no? Uh, well, Job was already, already a person that served God, and God bragged about Job. And, and the devil said the only reason why you bless him is because you have a hedge around him. and But when he took everything from Job, yet he still praised the Lord. Yeah. And because of his faithfulness, the Lord replaced everything that he lost and blessed him even yeah. more so. Okay, so, but you are saying that the case of Nebuchadnezzar and the case of Job is different. Yes. They, they okay, are different. two different things. Okay, and in our case, okay, if, if uh, we turn on God, and we do what Nebuchadnezzar does, uh, and things get taken away, we kind of know why. We can see the consequences of that. But in Job's case, Job didn't do anything wrong, right? And, and uh, we get this, and you're right, Art, we get this phrase from Job. You know, and that's, that's where it's found. Uh, Becky. Forgetting the one thing that gives and takes away is Christ. God gave us Christ to die for our sins, and he took away our sins through Christ. Okay. So that's a give and take away. So when he, yes. and, uh, and, and, and that's true. So what about when he takes away something that brings pain, like in Job's case? That's what we're referring to, because we want to know, right? Yes. I mean, if you're, if you're following God, yes. and then things are taken away from you, yes. right? I mean, I don't want, you know, in that case, I, I don't want to raise up to Job's uh, level, right? I mean, do you? I mean, I don't want to get to a place to where things are taken away from me and stuff like that, so that God would take away. F so, so what? What's up, Rudy? Is it isn't that what prayer is about? I mean, we pray God to, to give us something or to take away something. Um, that's that's a, a big portion of prayer. Okay, so then when God uh, take, are you, uh, let me just make sure I get this clear. So God, when God takes away something, even if it's painful. Uh, you know, that's, that's what happens. Is that the same case w uh, with death? Because my friend who, I mean, these are words that I have heard uh, my entire life that, uh, that, I mean, say, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord take it away. And, and let me tell you, uh, this is a believer. So, yeah. I think it's the context in which we're referring to taking mm -hmm. away. So okay. Some of the context people are saying that it's like they're taking God, God takes away something bad out of your life. Like, yeah. Like mm -hmm. he cleanses you of your skin. So good or bad That's or different. whatever. That's different than what you're talking about. I think you're saying like bad things happening to people. Okay. Take yeah. Them, right? So yeah. Yes. So instead of let, let's stay with Joe because that's the most ununderstandable, right? Yeah. I mean, we can understand the Nebuchadnezzar. We can understand something that's hurting us and God taking it away, like Rudy was saying. We can understand that. I can, I can wrap my mind around that one. I can wrap my, my mind around Nebuchadnezzar kind of a thing where Nebuchadnezzar turns on God and things are taken away. Yes. But the hard part is, is wrapping my mind around a, a righteous man like Job and, and that happening. So let me, you know, the, it says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. We just sang about it. 
uh, many sermons, many funerals, uh, this quote is, is given. Now, this statement originally came from the lips of uh, uh, Job, a man who lost everything. And in the book of Job, if you want to, if you have your Bibles, go there because we're going to spend some time there to get a better look at uh, in context of what is going on here. So in the book of Job, it's uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. If you're at Psalms, make a left turn. Um, you don't have to go far either. In the book of Job, we see the awful experience of a guy who loses his possessions, his health, and his children. He gets to keep his wife, although I have a feeling he would have traded her for one of the things that he lost after uh, she tells him to curse God and die, which is in verse 9 of chapter 2. Uh, Job expresses his reaction to his sufferings like this. Let's turn to uh, Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job 1, 21. And this is Job. He says this. It, it may be very familiar to you. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, that's where the song came from. There it is. If you have been around a church for the past 15 years, you've heard that song that we just sung earlier. Now, the context of Job saying this was worship as well. But let's stop for a moment and think about what this means. If you lose your job, did God take it away? Hmm. Maybe. If a woman is raped, did God take away from her? For the little child who was murdered, did God take them away? You see, is God the source of pain in our lives? No. We need to know this. No. Now think about it for a moment. This kind of thought, I mean, what kind of a sadistic view of God does this actually create? I mean, is this the stuff that we're supposed to sweep under the rug? and go, but God, how do we say blessed be the name of the Lord after all of that? I mean, that's kind of a, wow. I mean, thanks a lot, God. Uh, I'll praise you. Hmm, interesting, interesting. And, uh, and many people, they will use this excuse and say, what kind of a God is that? Right, and we sometimes we don't know. We 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 we, uh, um, we don't know how to answer that. Now, a Job's initial comments may have sounded worshipful to our ears. We even got a worship song out of it. It may sound worshipful to our ears today, especially if we're used to this idea. But as we continue reading, and as you read through Job you will see Job's pious view diminish. We will see what a belief in this kind of theology does to a person. This is the context we must read Job's initial statement with. So let's move to chapter 9 of Job and verse 22. 9, 22, 23, and 24. This is Job. This is his reaction to what God has done. He says, It is all one, therefore I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Who's he talking about? He's talking about God. Oh, hold on. He's talking about God. So does God really destroy the guiltless and the wicked? Does God really mock the innocent? I mean, really, let me read this again. It is all one, therefore I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. 
The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Interesting. Job's conclusion is that if God is the one who gives and takes away, then God is unjust. Well, good night, everybody. I just want no, we can't <laughs> stop there. Job doesn't even blame anything or anyone else. Surely it must be God? Did you catch that? This poor theology continues, and Job continues to move away from God. And then he says this in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 20. He says, Would he not let my few days alone? Withdraw from me that I may have a little cheer. That's the, the New American Standard. The New King James says it this way. Are not my days few? Cease. Leave me alone that I may take a little comfort. Wow. wow. We don't hear these verses, do we? No, we don't. Essentially, Job wants to be as far from God as possible. What were you talking about, Job, again earlier? <laughs> Is this how God works? Job wants nothing to do with God. And the more he thinks about this, the more he realizes that this kind of God actually isn't worth worshiping at all. It's in your Bible. Yeah. So, so Job, oh, Job, is that Job 21? Let's go to uh, chapter 21, verse 15. 21, 15 says this. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? Woo, here he goes. And what profit do we have if we pray to him? And then finally, Job makes this damning conclusion of God. In verse 21, he says, You have become cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. Now that is what Job's theology produces. It produces a God who becomes our enemy, who is cruel, who is not worth worshiping, and who wants to and who he wants to stay far away from job's reaction is consistent with the theology of the lord gives and the lord takes away <sighs> you want to hear the great news yes are you ready for some good news yes <laughs> ready job's theology is wrong God's not like that. You ever been upset? Yes. And you've said things? Yes. Watch what happens. You see, when God responds at the end of the book, God doesn't defend his actions to Job. He doesn't say that, well, you know, I have the right to take things away. He, does. he doesn't do that. No, he doesn't. No. God does not do that. Instead, God explains to Job that he's not like that. This causes Job to completely change his view of God that he started with in chapter 1. After Job sees through the inaccurate theology of what he spoke, he then says in Job 42, 3. I'm going to read 42, 3 and 6. Just to, It says this. You ask who is this? That questions my wisdom with such ignorance. And then verse 6 he says, I take back everything I said. Ha! Huh. And sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. And we tried to make sense of that theology. Yeah. And now Job says, I take back everything. You see how important it is not to take things out of context? Yes. What happens when you take a scripture from the middle of this book. 
he gives and takes away is part of an inaccurate theology. Let me say that again. He gives and takes away is part of an inaccurate theology. Just because it is in the Bible doesn't mean that it is referring to something good. Well, it's in the Bible, right? I mean, Jeff said that, and so we even write songs about it. We wrote a song about an inaccurate theology when Job is expressing his frustration. Yes. And he's, he's, he's drawing this conclusion of God out of his pain. And then he realizes that this is, this is the way God is. So then he says, uh, I take back everything. What happens if you miss that verse, though? Yeah, you got to make a song about wrong theology. <laughs> he gives and takes away. This has been used out of context. This is why it is important to know the context of the verse before choosing to use it. And sadly, too many people don't bother looking at the context. Even pastors especially if, if their pastor growing up used it. A good way to know when to look up context is when you come across something in the Bible that doesn't sound like it lines up with the heart of God. That's why we have spent that much time in the, the, our Thursday classes when we went through John and Matthew and now Revelation to learn the heart of the Father. And when it doesn't line up with the heart of the Father, you know what I mean when you listen to it and you go, oh, hmm. Just put it up on the shelf. Yeah, you put it up there and go, there must be something deeper, I don't know. You know, and you put it up there. <laughs> Things such as the Jesus conversation with the Samaritan woman. Right? I mean, um, or Jesus overturning the tables. Mm -hmm. Right? Oops. Jesus has a little temper, huh? <laughs> Right? And people have used that. They use that and say, well, Jesus got all mad. Right? You can call it righteous anger, call it whatever anger you want. He got mad and he lost his temper, but he didn't lose his temper. He did that. But it wasn't out of an uncontrolled anger. It wasn't out of, he didn't lose his temper. In fact, if you look closely, we won't go, we don't have time to go there. But if you look closely, when all of that happens, he stops. It says that he stops and he makes a whip. It's coming at you. Just watch out. That's not somebody who lost their temper, right? And just throws whatever's at him, you know? No. Interesting, huh? When, when he speaks with a Samaritan woman at the well, a very common, out of context, preached, taught passage. When Jesus says, go tell your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, I know. You've had five. <laughs> And the one that you're with, the, and the man that you live with now is not even your husband. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Jesus caught her. Woo! Did he? Because does that line up with everything else of Jesus? Haven't you ever heard that and went, that's kind of weird, Jesus being really mean like that. It's, you know, it kind of like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense. And so I've heard that preached my whole life. I've heard that Jesus will read your mail. And you can't get away because he says, I know that's not your husband. You, you've had five husbands. And the, one that, the man that you're living with now is not even your husband. Wow. How does that make her feel? Probably about this small. Why would, yeah, why would Jesus insult a person and knock them down? That's not like him. That's not like any other thing. So we have to take these things that don't make sense and look at the context of it. Now, here's the, here's, here's the thing about that story real quickly. When she hears the story, now the Samaritans were enemies of the Judeans. Yeah. Jesus was a Judean. 
Judeans didn't speak to Samaritans at that time. That's another story. And not only that, a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman, which in that culture is even lower. And he speaks to her and he talks to her. And the Bible says that she, go, she leaves there, goes back to her community, her village, and she says, I found the Messiah. And they all followed her out there. Okay, number one, if she was a prostitute, if she was a whore, you think that she would have been respected in her town? You think they would have believed her? No. She would have no credibility. I mean, the Samaritans were not wicked people. They just wanted, they just, instead of, uh, they wanted to follow Joseph and they just didn't agree with the whole, uh, they, they read the Torah and followed the Torah in their way and Judeans in their way, but they still held up God. They still had moral uh, 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 virtue. And so they would not have respected her or believed her. But yet she had such respect that when she went back to her village and told them that she found the Messiah and he's a Judean. Okay, right there, people are like, forget that. No, right? They believed her. What kind of credibility must she have had? An upstanding. Well, then how does, he, how does this work then? Why would Jesus read her mail like that and catch her? What if he didn't? What if he used the same words and when, she, when he said, go tell your husband, and she says, I don't have a husband, she goes, I know you don't have a husband. In other words, I know everything about you. I know every pain. I know every sorrow. I know everything that you've struggled with. I know you. And the one you're living with now probably was maybe a brother, an uncle, which is a disgrace. It just lived there and it's probably embarrassing for her. You the same words. But you see, it lines up with who Jesus was. Because what she said was this. You must be a prophet. Why? Because you know the truth. And she went and she went and did that and said that. See, that lines up. So what happens to these teachings about, you know, she was a prostitute and a whore and a you know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. See, there we have to, this is why it's important to look at the context, especially in places that we go, hmm, what? If it doesn't seem like it fits, it probably doesn't fit. He gives and takes away. I struggled with that growing up. Like I heard it at funerals. When I traveled with Frank Gonzalez, I was 18 when I started. We traveled around the country with an evangelist and we were in a different town, in a different city every week of the year. My first time that I got to pray with somebody, the first church, I don't know, somewhere back east somewhere. And the first time I got to go, and normally what happened is the, uh, there's an altar call would be given and people would come up to the altar for whatever reason. And then we as the team members would come behind them and place our hand on their shoulder and, and ask if they would like to go pray in a, in a side room over, over there. And we go take them over there while they or close up the service or whatever. <laughs> so we did. And I had a couple and, and, and I walked over there and, and they walked with me into the prayer room. And I sat there and I asked this question because I was told that this is what you say. I said, I said, why did you come forward? And they began to tear up. And, she, and the mother said, our five-year-old boy died last week. Why did, God, why did God take him away? She goes, answer me that. Why did God take our boy away? Well, that was my first time. Um, <laughs> You know, I couldn't even think of an answer. I just kind of froze. And you know those times where you say you laugh with those who laugh and cry with those who cry? Yeah, we just had a crying time at that moment because I did not know what to say. This is real things. 
If we continue to not find the context, then popular songs will be continue to be sung and sermons will continue to be taught out of context. Why? Because that's what they heard. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that it's appropriate to use to confirm your point. For example, here's a verse that might not be good to use in a worship song. You may, you be the judge of that, okay? Even though it's in the Bible, all right? So Joyce, would you look up 1 Samuel chapter 20? That NLT, right? Chapter 20, verse 30, read it loud, read it proud. <laughs> Go ahead. Saul. Louder. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. You stupid son of a whore. He swore at him. Do you think I don't know that you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? Read that first line again. <laughs> I missed it. I missed it. Sorry. I was, uh, my mind was, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. You stupid son of a whore, he swore at him. Wow. Do you think I don't know that you want him to be king in your, your place, shaming yourself and your mother? I just like the first part, but that was good. That's the other guy. <laughs> wow. I, uh, I don't know if you heard that. That was a Joyce reading. Um, <laughs> That's why you picked me. Yes. <laughs> you see, just because it's in the Bible... Doesn't mean it's appropriate to use yeah. in any way. Yeah. You got to be careful because somebody could use this and say, hey, it's in the Bible. Right. Right. I'll even give you the scripture. Right. Wow. Okay, back to our text. What is the context? Job's theology was wrong. The context is that God is not like that. And when God responds at the end of the book, he doesn't defend himself. He doesn't say, hey, I'm God. I could take and give because I'm God. He doesn't do that. No, why? Instead, he explains to Job that he's not like that. This causes Job to completely change his view of God that he started with in the first chapter. And after Job, after Job sees through the inaccurate theology, that's when he says, I take back everything I said. And I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Job repents of this awful view of God. And I think many of us need to do the same today. Too many of us have falsely attributed all manners of evil to the source of goodness himself. There are a lot of false accusations happening in this book. Job's wife and friends falsely accuse him of being in the wrong. Then Job falsely accuses God of doing the wrong to him. And throughout the book of Job, we see that the catalyst of all that happens in this story is actually Satan himself. And when Job gets a glimpse of this, he repents of his initial conclusion that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You know, I knew that, and when I hear that, and when I heard my friend say that we were in a place where there was a number of us sitting around having lunch, and, and my heart just sank. I mean, I know he was going through grief. This wasn't a time for a teaching. This wasn't a time for me to correct his theology. I didn't quite know what to do. But when he began to say, I'm angry, because God took that away. If I was with that couple back when I was 18 and I would sit with them now, I would say that wasn't God. God doesn't take the lives of people. Yeah, but what about, what about nothing? Show me the heart of God. Yeah, but what about the destruction? What about this? What about, you know, there's bad things in the Bible. Hey, I just, we just read a passage that was inappropriate, how are you going to use this? And what's the context? And then Jesus comes. 
Jesus comes and the son shows us the heart of the father for the first time. Mm -hmm. He says, you want to see the father? He goes, you've seen me, you see the father, Jesus says. So if you want to see what God would do, watch what Jesus did. Boy, those little bracelets were a little more powerful than we thought, huh? WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? That's why when people say, oh, all the, these earthquakes and all this disaster happening and all these things happening, boy, it's God's judgment. Where in the Gospels do you see Jesus bringing calamity and tragedy in order to turn people around? He doesn't. What did Jesus do to a storm? Calm he calmed it. God is good. And we see the fullness of his character and the overwhelming generosity and sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross, not in the tragedy of heartbreak and loss. So the next time you experience a deep loss, understand that God is on your side and he can bring light into every dark situation. You may not know why something in your life is taken away, but you can be confident that God isn't the source of your tragedy. And that's important to know. He is not the source of your tragedy. I want to close with the words to a song that keep ringing in my heart and in my mind as of late. It's like I can't get this song out of my mind. You ever have that happen? Yes. Yeah. Listen to these words. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. And I've known you as a father. And I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing 
of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Father, may I never again look to you as the source of tragedy, but instead as the source of life, freedom, and goodness. In your name. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. And may you see the goodness of God around you. In Jesus' name.